guys today. Um, just for you that don't know me, I'm uh, Mike Du, uh, Mike Duke, full account manager here at uh, SafeReach. Uh, been here for uh, uh, almost three years now, so uh, very excited to uh, moderate this uh, discussion. Uh, so just a quick intro. Uh, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with uh, detection engineering. Um, but uh, for you that are a little bit newer to the theme, uh, detection engineering is the process of building, uh, refining, and managing detection content to identify and respond to suspicious or malicious activity uh, in the environment. Um, as you know, uh, there's a lot of challenges to it. Um, really, the challenge with detection engineering is the need for speed uh, in an ever-evolving threat landscape. Um, you know, sifting through large amounts of data from various sources, uh, ensuring reliable detections while reducing false positives. Um, uh, we want to discuss how organizations can leverage safe reach, uh, ability to continuously uh, simulate real-world tactics and techniques to help create and validate and ensure detections are working today, tomorrow, and into the future. Um, so joining me today are our two SMEs here. Um, I have Ash Beachman, uh, Incident Response and Specialist from WebTech, and uh, Dennis Chow, former CISO and leading expert in detection engineering. Um, thank you guys for being a part of this discussion. Thanks. Absolutely, yeah, thanks for having us. Okay, so uh, we'll start off with the first question, and I'll uh, ask this to both of you. Uh, what are the biggest challenges of detection engineering uh, for you guys? What do you start? <laughs> Uh, for us, one of the biggest challenges was how to effectively present that data. Um, you can get so much data out of any BAS platform, definitely safe breach. Uh, so how, how do you distill that down and present that in a manner, with, whether it be to another team within your uh, information technology organization or your CISO or C-suite, um, and, and distill it down and point, actually point out to them um, sometimes in not very technical terms, right? Here's what we need to fix, and here's how we fix it. I think for us, it's been a lot of the use case creation and validation of testing. I think um, it was echoed a little bit earlier about the automation detection of scope pipelining. Um, Recommend unit tests and integration tests are, are pretty difficult in terms of time to spend. So I think things like BASIS can help out with instrumentation. Um, and not losing that work. And the other aspect of, as to what you've alluded to is really um, not just communicating the, the issues, but also what your metrics are of the detection engineering program. So what metrics are you looking for besides true positive, false positive, positive benign? Uh, what is your mean time to check? Does that include your input of logging? How does uh, BASIS help out with that? What does your tooling look like? And how does that instrumentation help? And so I think something like this can really help out with the, um, the greater organization at the Fusion Center level. Yeah. And so I think Garrett uh, had kind of mentioned this as well, right? So uh, it's a lot of manual processes before using SafeReach. So how were you guys doing this before SafeReach and, and you know, um, you talk about that? Sure. Um, in all honesty, it was very manual. Um, pen testing, um, we don't have a dedicated red team, so some you know, red teaming functions. Uh, even there, even times where th there were, uh, you know, in the media type threats where we would just try to uh, trigger it ourselves <laughs> manually, uh, which is not, you know, obviously not not best case uh, best case scenario. Very very manual, just different flavors of pen testing is what I would say. Right. So I mean, how many detections could you realistically develop during that time? Very few. Yeah. I I see BAS as like an accelerator. Some of our, our hard-earned detections have been you know, manual as well. Um, I think there's always a process that you take research um, and threat intelligence and you actually use it for your informed defense. So there's that lead time that comes with that. Um, and then as, as the aspect of it is you're developing this, you're also doing testing as iterations um, as you're developing your use cases. Now that's more than just seeing, you're talking about WAF rules, you're talking about EDR rules, etc. cetera. Um, and then how do you get beyond IOCs and TTP? And so, all that kind of breaks it down to you know adding lead time and detection uh, process of that, um, and then last on the back end of that is the manual research side of it, manual testing um, and things like that. So where where we can really accelerate is where uh, where you can actually inject optimization and all of that. So we're moving from trying to move before testing individual unit use cases for a very specific focus on the IOC and IOA, for instance. 
uh, to more of a TTV based model that everyone seems to talk about, but they don't really do so in the process, uh, in the process that they do. So I think you need to really set yourself up um, to actually prepare yourself for a bad solution uh, to kind of help you uh, mitigate some of that. So that's what we've been doing uh, so far, and so what I've also seen a lot of customers do from a manual testing perspective and manual development perspective. Okay, another point there, if I may. Yeah. Um, I, call, I won't mention products for, for the obvious reasons here, but um, there was a specific instance to talk about you know, the efficacy of testing your controls. Uh, there was a specific scenario that I remember where um, our, we're, uh, it's a scenario we have that we run regularly, um, automated, the whole thing. Uh, the, the test ran and I noticed a significant drop in the score um, on, on the, specifically for endpoint. The score just plummeted. And I'm looking at the insights panel um, and I noticed a large amount of, um, and I apologize if, if some of you guys aren't using the platform, if you're not familiar, feel free to pull me off the side and like, what the world are you talking about? Um, but the score dropped, I'm looking at the insights panel and I noticed that just a crazy uptick in malware execute, malware pre-drop pre to the point where I reached out to not only the team that manages our EDR platform, but reached out to that platform itself, like their tech support. Um, and their little little first question was, well, what hashes were successful? And I'm rubbing my head going, okay, those hashes can change tomorrow. So without the, the insight from Safe Breach, um, we still would have been in that specific context and going forward, you know, from a BAS program perspective, think about how manual that is. Well, we didn't have to mess with all that because of the insights panel and the other things baked into they breach so much more automated, like you said. And then, like you also potentially are missing coverage on like all your aspects of your program, right? Not just a tool, but um, right. You know how you're tracking all that. So I think that kind of helps add into how you optimize what you're using so far with Safe Breach. Right. Uh, so I actually ask you uh, this question here. Um, so how has Safe Breach improved your detection engineering schemes to identify? Oh, I didn't tend to jump the gun here, sorry. Um, so the example I just gave, um, for us, it, it's I can even I can even give you a, a quantification on how um, much it's reduced our time for detections. Uh, again, we will go into specifics here, but we're in the process of, of planning uh, EDR migration from one platform to another. Um, instead of having to do, like you and I keep talking about, instead of having to do manual configurations and go back and forth with whoever the EDR platform company is or whatever, um, there's simulations already on, like I could spin one up on my laptop right now, and as long as I've got a safe reach host, which takes that long to configure, I can see how that EDR platform is going to perform in our environment. I mean, again, faster than I can even really think how to quantify for you guys. Um, if we didn't have that now, and in, in my particular company, we've got 27,000 employees in, in 50 countries, I think the last time I checked, we had 23,000 plus Windows endpoints. So we can't exactly just like roll the dice and risk that any of our platform's not gonna work right. Um, it's gonna impact production somewhere, right? So the, the fact that Safe Breach is, has so much ready to go out of the box and there's really is not much manual configuration is huge for us. Yeah. What, what reduction in time do you feel that that's had in terms of trying to evaluate products? Reduction for us in, in months, I mean, we're, I think, first stage is going to be in the double digits of thousands for when we start migrating to our new EDR platform. Just as an example, um, when we go to that new EDR platform, um, it, it would have taken us months to, to manually test that stuff. Um, we, we've done the same thing for uh, web application firewall rules. We had a, a sig significant um, RLI there and, and fantastic impact and efficacy of controls there. We were able to, I think this year we rolled out six or seven new web application firewall rules. Um, and for our organization in particular, we have over 300 um, public facing applications. So the, 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 the ability to get the insight from Safe Breach, um, test the new set of rules in, in dev or stage, and then turn around and bring it to change control um, and get those those changes done in you know, a matter, matter of a uh, couple of months, a couple of weeks, depending on what you're talking about, is. is huge, I mean, again, reduction in, in turnaround of um, <coughs> testing in five months for sure, for us, which is huge. Uh, so Dennis, I'll ask you this uh, next question. Uh, what are some key takeaways you've experienced through implementing Safe Breach? Um, it's really about looking at that as a program, not necessarily a tool. And there's a couple things that you really need to do for preparation of such things for a really good success. Your CSMs will help out with this, but obviously, 
um, look at TTPs, right? Uh, understand that you're using use cases for it much more than just a scene. You're looking at multiple technologies in a greater sense of the program. Um, but number two, also prepare what your what good looks like. What's your baseline? Um, I know that sounds very basic, but um, when you look at TV and programs and, and data that comes from that, what is representative of your environment? And you may not have this depending on your level of maturity. So um, reach out to your different vendors, reach out to your different um, departments, and really figure out where your scope is for what production looks like. You're never going to have a perfect non-production uh, image or use case in those cases. So you know, go ahead and make sure that you have that ready to go um, as part of your implementation. Get, the, get an idea before you kind of start onboarding it. Um, the, the third thing I would say is uh, make, sure, make use of your integrations. Right? There's native integrations that go from API to API uh, between your scene, your EDR, your WAF, whatever. Um, but at the same time, you, know, you can also utilize injecting logs. Right? Some of the synthetic use cases that you can do is figure out how do you generate logs. And generative AI can come in to kind of bolster some of this. Um, but also utilize your SDK with safe groups in this case. Um, so when you look at detection as code and look at the pipelines, you can do so much more than uh, validating syntax. You can do more things like unit level testing, um, and really it's more about the catalog of your unit test. So when you create a unit test, you're not creating a unit case uh, test and let's say pi test for some reason, and it's just kind of lost in that one aspect. You're looking at um, safe breach in terms of a total lifecycle management of your testing. Um, so when you think about that aspect of it strategically, um, you can help you from a tactical perspective of which use cases to start with first, uh, what unit tests you need to be doing, what is a unit test for you in the CI pipeline versus an integration level test, and that can help you with your maturity portion of it. Um, and of course, give ample feedback to your CSMs, right? So um, we've had times where we needed API changes at the back end. They've been able to turn this around in a couple of days, and so that keeps us going on for the acceleration process of our um, maturity level. So. Uh, you brought up a good theme, like, uh, you know, we heard Garrett say as well, this is a program, right? So there's obviously a lot of teams that are engaged and involved. So how do you uh, engage these teams and work with them and show them that uh, that SafeReach is there to, to benefit them as well and not just be another tool um, within your uh, environment? Sure. I mean, when you think about the BAS program, you know, other than the straight-up reporting out of the box and customizations you can do, Who's the owner? And I think this was asked in some of the lounge questions with some of the uh, other TAMs and whatnot. Um, when you look at risk and look at architecture, really you want to separate from SecOps and the pen testers of who's owning this tool. Um, so who's, who's getting the output from this tool, who's got the most stake in it, and so some, sometimes maybe separating the owner helps out, but also understanding that the, what's coming out of it being vector-based, uh, what is your risk scoring. If you make use of the tooling and, and optimize everything, even if you haven't defined it truly in your organization, if you start off with the proposed framework, um, you can actually start providing quantitative numbers. And what leadership really understands is how much time you're saving, um, how much were you saving beforehand, uh, what's, uh, what's the money savings value out of it, right? If, you, if say, freeze costs you for your organization 100K, are you getting 150K of return on investment out of it? And if you measure that um, with time savings, time that's cost the analyst or an engineer, even if you're having to do it manually via Jira tickets as opposed to the integration, um, what you're really capturing is the, the justification of expanding that product um, in tandem when you're engaging with these people. So would you have that ready to go as your CYA for yourself of going, yes, we need to innovate further. We need to uh, hook into these. It's going to save your team time because you can also do the uh, service on demand thing. Um, if your customer forward is um, centric around security in internally as well as externally, um, I think that goes a long way in terms of even engaging along with security architecture and engineering teams to kind of help bolster that out. Um, so there's other use cases beyond that um, besides the pen test and red team, right? There's other things like how can you use the BAS program to actually leverage um, not just continuous testing, but um, training validation, right? If you have SOC analysts and you're trying to figure out um, if they're triaging the right way or operationalizing um, the playbooks or runbooks, can you use BAS to kind of help out with that? And so these are the use cases that you should be thinking about at the managerial level to help you out with some of this engagement. Uh, and Ash, this one's to you. So you know, you talked about you know the time reduction and some of the um, the offs that, that you're doing. But as far as detections are concerned, um, are you have you been able to reduce the time to create these detections and test them? We talked about manual testing and maybe multiple iterations, how is 
How's NAS helped you with that? Definitely. So in addition to the, the bake offs we have conducted and will we'll continue to conduct, um, we've also been able to, we have a partnership with MSSP, uh, so we have thousands of use cases. Um, we've been able to, go. this is more on the manual side, I'll speak to the manual side versus the autom automation side, which we, we leverage that too. Um, not as much as some ones, we're, we're getting there. But um, on the manual side, we're able to test um, and provide actionable data and documentation to, in this case, the examples of MSSP on Hey, this um, this rule or this use case that you know they blessed is perfect. Well, it's not firing, and here's why we can tell them why. Um, now, that's not something obviously you, you want to get in the habit of doing, but it's it's, it's a, a useful thing uh, to have there. We've also written several um, custom use cases that make more sense, or written or retuned uh, several use cases that make more sense for our environment. Because again, having you know, 27,000 employees, 20,000 plus endpoints. We have a pretty diverse um, ecosystem at my company. Uh, so that's been invaluable to us, for us to, um, again, write synthetic use cases, um, test uh, uh, MSSP, scene rules, uh, Splunk logic, whatever the case is, um, been huge for us. Uh, and then Dennis, um, can you tell us why continuous testing of these uh, detections are important uh, in the environment? Um, you know, in general, the automation, right? We, we go back to what costs you guys money, what costs security operations teams money, how do you justify more budget? Um, and so, you know, the importance of that is, you know, paramount to any detection engineering team. But even if you're not having a de de get it, yeah, dedicated DE team, um, if you're looking at security engineers or analysts, they're also doing some sort of tuning, right? So they have a hands inside use case development lifecycle, regardless if you really want them to or not. And so if you can actually integrate this with your APIs and right, put this inside um, a pass fail kind of logical state inside your, your pipelines, even if you don't have one, do it manually in a process perspective. You're really going to um, accelerate your quality control um, as well as your true, you know, true positive ratio and your signal to noise ratios with that. I think the, the challenge with some of that is the, how much time you spend in your SDK, right? How much time do you... Um, want to spend that ahead of time as opposed to after post implementation. So I think that's something to that really kind of explore as well um, when you're pursuing this validation perspective. Um, I guess for those that are not sure with a dedicated detection engineering team or a detection as code uh, pipeline, start with staging. Um, so you don't have to actually fully deploy um, in a full CD perspective. You can also do pure CI um, and then focus on staging it out to a uh, um, a, a way of testing. So you can actually have two avenues. Uh, take each level of testing with this catalog of TTPs, customizations, and then make sure you, you know, implement those, uh, those tests and payloads inside your, your platform. The second aspect is you can actually utilize uh, the BADS as a check against manual testing. I say manual testing. Let's look at uh, PCAPs or Network Security Fran, uh, for instance. Uh, Palo Alto will accept Snort 2.9 style rules, so you can actually utilize Siricata as an alternate engine and then make a comparison that gets between safe breach um, simulations of, of what comes up from that from just a simple unit test. And make sure you integrate those back into your, your reporting workflow. And I think if you do that, um, and if you go one step further, take that reporting workflow and go to the Jira management workflow of that and assign it out to your uh, engineering teams or your SOC analysts for, for that, you can actually have a really nice state of of uh, value-added kind of response and, and reporting that goes with that in a more automated fashion. And you can, you can scale this out, right? You can use GitHub Cloud, you can use uh, Jira Free Edition. So those of you that are small organizations, you don't have to be stuck using only enterprise um, costing tools to kind of help integrate this for a, a larger value. Okay. And I'll also say, right, we want to make sure that the detections are still working, you know, um, you know from the day that you wrote it till Right. right, so there's revisions that happen with that. How do you measure false positives and, and the signals and noise ratio with that? And so, like, if, you, if you're making those workflows, and this goes back to our, uh, our the previous questions, like preparing for a BADS program, um, if you start defining these right now, this will help you get the most out of it. And so, if you're backboarding some of that, I believe some of those customers are utilizing um, the SOAR automations that kind of feed back into SafeBreach. Um, you're getting those levels and richness, but um, where you decide to have those reports and those data sets is really dependent on you. So as long as you're having that and defining those, put it somewhere 
and then utilize that as your console um, as a choice, and then figure out how you want to use BAS or SafeBridge in this case uh, for the remainder of your workflows. Okay. Great. Well, thank you guys. Um, so I think we'll uh, open it up to questions if anybody has questions for our guests. So this question is for that. Can you tell us a little bit what detection engineering is from? Uh, if we talk about we build things, we build. What, what what does that really mean? What are we doing? Given that you have detections that are that are coming in your sim or something, what are you doing outside of that to actually build a detection engineering? Um, at the program level or at the program level? At the program level. So detection engineering is really the cross section between taking threat intelligence. The security research side, and if you don't have those items today, they are kind of doing this on your behalf too. So there's there's that large and small aspect of it. Um, so they're taking all that, figuring out payload, and figuring out the best mechanism for uh, where you can actually validate and inject those detections. Not all of it has to be at the scene, right? Some of this could be upstream of the scene. In some cases, uh, let's say DLP like like those exposures, canary tokens, whatnot. Things was mentioned as well. The source side of it. Can you retroactively automate that? And so what they're doing is actually uh, parsing out what the best uh, mechanism of security research payload should be done for um, the alerting side of it, as well as the response side. So there's two main avenues of every detection engineering program, right? There's the detection itself and how you implement those uh, lifecycle rules, and then there's the automated response that comes with that. Um, so how you validate that, maybe BAS ties that into you as well. Um, and where you implement those, you know, depending on each organization. But those are the two primary functions that I see most detection engineering programs move to. And then every great detection engineering program also includes a research team uh, in tandem with it. When you look at other major vendors, uh, Amazon, Datadog, uh, you know, even, even recently KPMG, you're, you're looking at a joint effort in that detection engineering perspective. So they're not just creating rules. They're not just creating behaviors, they're actually moving into many different facets of security operations and really at the center heart of um, you know, what, what the rest of the team is do, SOC analysts rely on them, um, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of where the program kind of sits and should mature in the near future when you're looking at um, multiple vendors. So just a quick question if you don't mind. Um, I know you're only two customers of many, but I'm wondering if there was a shareable place, would you guys be willing, as well, if other customers were also willing, when you came up with your design, this is why, this is how I deploy, this is my strategy. Are you guys willing to share that? Because I'm sitting here asking myself, am I willing to share that? I, I, I don't see any reason why, but I think some of the value with this tool is I may have a strategy, but maybe different from someone else's. And they both may have value, and the other isn't thinking about it, and how do we encourage each other collectively to have the best implementation? Or I chose these set of algorithms out of 27,000 to run the use cases, right? Yeah. I chose these thousand in this quarter to go run, or whatever the plan of plan is. Just be able to express those things in some forum I'm not sure if we have a form like that to do that, but I think it would be, I wonder what your thoughts are. Would you be willing to do that? Because I'm asking myself the same question on my interest. I don't see why not. I, I, I believe so. Um, when you look at the industry as a whole, Seam started with this too, right? There was a Seam community need, SOC Prime kind of filled it with Sigma. I think, let's say, Preach and Baz, right? You'll have some of the more mature APIs. You'll have some of the um, client facing scripts that you could share as an inner community. Um, and then there could be two aspects of it, right? There are tier one, which is more public level, um, and then like a tier two, which is more of a private by industry sector level, almost like an ISAC, but for the ads and detection engineering, um, I'd like to help out with that. I think if you tie that with uh, uh, major other consortium of efforts, Rapid7 has their attack KB and the other researcher components, you could actually pull that in there and reduce the mean time to detect further, creating, creating better value add at the com uh, community level as well. Um, and that way you can actually utilize uh, more than just saying random research here. You're collectively having all that in into this work stream of starting with the community 
and then accelerating yourself with the tool implementation as well. So uh, those are my thoughts. Sure. Um, I, I would say we would definitely, uh, the, like you mentioned, the tier one and tier two would make a lot of sense. Some, excuse me. <clears throat> Some of the industry specific stuff might not be relevant to other organizations. In the same breaths, uh, a lot of it would be relevant to all of us who are trying to either build a bass program or a mature one. Uh, you guys heard me comment during, during Jen's talk. We, we couldn't be in more different industries, but the automation piece that she's using, um, once I get some time on her calendar, is going to be invaluable to our organization. I already know that. I haven't even, even touched the stuff that she's talking about on an automation level, but I can, I can already see the, like the wheels are already turning in my head for value add and ROI. So definitely. Uh, Follow-up question. So when you think about the post-triggering, post-detection process and two ways, different ways, I wonder how you look at it. Uh, first of all, from you know the overall pipe uh, standpoint, so you know testing your pipes beyond you know triggering an alert. And do you test that at all? You know, sending the ticket to service now, whatever you know the process is within the company. Uh, and second, how do you look at the human element? Of you know detection engineering, so you know training that uh, that muscle, uh, and there's a, there's a obviously a fine line between fatigue and training. So how do you look at these two aspects? Uh, great question. <laughs> I would say the the process side for the pipeline. Um, right now, most customers I've helped implement this kind of program um, is still stuck in the unit level testing, integration level testing, and it's per, per detection as opposed to, as you mentioned, like a profile. I think in the near future, if you're realizing all the APIs or perhaps, you know, this becomes a product enhancement, not sure, um, utilizing some of that research and, and closing that, that gap in there. And what I see is, um, and this alludes to my previous question and answer here, is that perhaps architecture has a better um, kind of stake in the game where they're actually seeing the vectors. Uh, when you're looking at threat modeling and whatnot, I'm not, not saying this becomes a threat modeler, but if you can actually provide a uh, structured information of threat modeling back into it, you can quantify that risk and then further figure out how you do the testing scenarios. Do you do a batch of them uh, right now? And a lot of customers so far don't, don't do batches of those. Um, some of the more advanced customers that I've seen um, will select a series of TTPs of, let's say, legacy rules or rules that have gone um, like 90 days or less, uh, or 90 days or more without firing. And so when they're testing those true positives um, versus false positives or even just uh, false negatives, um, I see them doing more batch related items there and that can kind of move you towards that, that profiling and that threat actor type. Um, so I do think there's other opportunities and uh, I know everyone's sick of hearing generative AI and whatever, um, but if you use the scripting or SOAR or whatever you've decided to utilize for your platform, um, that can also add work that as a tool and a program, it as a feedback loop that should give you these uh, synthesized or fuzz based um, change that happens over time with um, your threat actor. So I think this is also with the command presentation as well, uh, where you're taking those intelligence sources, you're making derivatives of what they're, what they're likely to do based on what you forecast later on, and you're implementing and saving those into your catalog of your, of your payloads. And then you're running those tests and, and what I mentioned, those TTP type clusters. And you can get yourself closer that way. How do we do full vector testing and um, things that security architects will more likely see as opposed to individualized unit level testing? Uh, I'm not entirely sure yet, but I do think it'll take um, more of a platform centric approach um, and additional development from the security community as a whole to kind of start sharing some of these things that you utilize with, in this case, the SDK with BAS. Um, I think there was an, uh, the other question that you had was the people element of this. And I, I think where we come from that is validating training, validating um, how efficient our education engineers are. Um, we need a way of instrumenting that further, like how do we test how fast these detections work versus pass fail. Do we even make it pass fail? Do we have, hey, here's a likelihood of this test passing because of a number of edge cases as you're fussing these, these tests yourself. And as you're putting that into your feedback loop, this can actually help you figure out where in the stage of detection you can probably you sit. So if you're looking at advanced engineers, they're going to be creating things that are more behavioral based, and you'll be able to test what larger you know, data sets and, and fuzzing. If you're looking at more junior detection engineers, you'll see more IOA or IOC based, and so they'll, you'll be able to see testing failures and uh, recommendations, maybe have in with AI, uh, that give you a certain level of confidence level of how far they can go, which uh, threat actors are likely more advanced and less advanced, 
um, that your current level of detection and pipelining is going with. Um, how we measure that, I'm not entirely sure yet, but um, you know, I think that if you're looking at that, you can certainly create the obligations with this. So for us, the, <clears throat> speaking to your question about the human element, um, we have and will continue to use Safe Reach, leverage Safe Reach um, to train our analysts and, and senior engineers and everybody um, on a little bit of everything. Um, we have a pretty broadly experienced team, very seasoned people, but they come, a lot of them came from different uh, aspects of IT and or information security, cybersecurity. Um, so it's been valuable to us to allow them to um, see and again test 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 our um, our processes, right? But in engaging with the people element there or, or lack thereof, we've uh, <clears throat> on multiple occasions have had instances where we were um, running a running a given scenario and found a hole in a process. Like, okay, we need to improve here, or this is some stuff we need to train our people up on. Right, so it's been valuable there um, to the testing the pipes or outside, which I think I heard you say. Um, Safe breach has been valuable for us there as well. Um, again, the, the I'll give you a little hanging free answer. Um, it, I, I, I lost track of how many times we've been able to improve um, processes or integrations with different tools and platforms um, using Safe Breach. It, it literally walked us to, to wherever the hole was, right? To put it simply. There's also the risk aspect of it, like where yep. your risk programs, if you sure. don't have one today, perhaps your, your CISO or your privacy team knows, and definitely they can give you hints on where you can possibly start with some of these profiles and human aspects of, of testing via the past program too. Yeah, definitely. We have, we have uh, there's evolutions that are already on the calendar, so to speak, for um, at the cusp of our, <coughs> excuse me, the cusp of our MDR um, migration going from one platform to another. That's going to be a, a huge area where we can leverage um, not only safe breach, but continue to go our, go our BASC program and again, like test our people, their response to any given situation, um, test all, all different types of integrations with the next uh, EDR platform we're gonna use. Um, so it's gonna be big in that area as well. From both a, a process and pipe and human perspective. Yeah, so I've got one. Um this, by the way, you know, you guys have a lot of tacit knowledge, so thanks for sharing that with the group and everything. I think that's really cool. Um, if you look at the unintentional threat actor, i.e. DevOps, <laughs> you know where I'm going here. You know, is there, have you guys like turned the, turned the tables back internally to look at the unintended consequence of somebody building, you know, the next school app for the organization and helping them test stuff? Because in my experience, they're really good at writing applications and making things you know cute and pretty, but they're not really good at making them secure. So any any thoughts on that? It's kind of the people aspect of it and sure. training and all that. So love your thoughts. Oh, sure, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I, I think it depends on where your maturity is in your pipeline. Some people start off with my first deployment or my first staging um, and my first um, validation of, of linting and whatnot. I think if you, you need to combine it with, obviously, with your basics, like your SaaS, your SEAs, and stuff like that. So your AppSec team still need to provide that shift left perspective. Um, the shift right perspective is maybe you have a second pipeline, and there goes into simulation testing that goes in tandem with your pen test team, or your web team is doing dynamic level testing, and full on interactive level testing, your IS side. Um, and I think if you create that pipeline, it'll help that bring together some of your pen test teams and red teams, and get them really engaged in this aspect of it. Um, that second pipeline is more than just automated testing paths, failing you hand out of a quarter to your ticket to your dev, dev team. That's not how you need to work for a process to focus and, and people want to focus. I think also there's a great amount of education that still needs to be made. So that pipeline is just one aspect of your entire program. I would say maybe have um, CTFs, lunch and learnings workshops that go in um, using your top risk, risky areas or top identified exposure areas and then we'll walk them through the entire path. The BAS obviously can help you with that tooling, which visualizes some of this for you, um, and then contextualizes it back to them and saying, okay, we've done this manually for now, um, and then over the next weeks or months that you've kind of set a maturity timeline for yourself, perhaps give them that ability to self-run those tests and instrument it themselves, and so that you're also democratizing and distributing the, the safe breach or any BAS solution that you're looking for uh, program all together, which is you know, BAS everywhere in this case. Sure, so I've got, you're gonna get more than you bargained for, I've got two answers for you. So uh, one, one answer I'm gonna give you is uh, in our environment, we have quite a few um, 
crap use being polite, but we've had quite a few custom use cases. Stuff that you would hopefully, written for stuff that you would hope to, hope to, hope to never see, but we want to test it, right? So, so we've been able to test those use cases, right? So something that we, I'm talking stuff you pray you never see, but we can test and, and validate, right? That if by some stretch of whatever, this actually happens and it's, and I'm intentionally not going into specifics, happens in our environment, ends up in our environment, um, would, would our pipeline of alerting and, and ticketing, would, would the right people uh, and teams be notified in the right way in an effective time frame? So that's that's one way where, yes, we've been able to test it. And, and I can go into some specifics, so like maybe be a rogue DHCP server, I know that's very specific, but like a rogue DHCP server, um, an orphaned like AWS reposit repository of some way, shape, or form, right? Um, just for a couple, I could, I could go on and on. Um, the other one, too, that we've been able to, I'm trying to think, I don't know, that answers your question, we're good. The other one was, what was it? Yeah. We would have been here for 20 minutes, I'm not gonna talk. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yes, sir. Thank you, great question. So it's okay, I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question you guys were talking about web development. So a lot of our use cases are egress, obviously look at the inbound from the egress, but probably through a firewall interface, not necessarily from a web app web sure. or through a WAF even. Have you guys developed, do you have those use cases? I mean, have inside SafeReach, have you come up with a, yeah, this is what we pull these use cases and we run them on some cadence on all of our you know, web interfaces that you're hosting or somewhere you have them hosting. Have you come up with that scenario? Is that part of your world? It, it's definitely part of the world for a lot of customers. Like if you're looking at um, web workloads and workloads in general, you have the front end, and then you have traditionally the mid tier and then the back end. Um, what's what a lot of engineers start with protection engineering use cases? They, they typically start off with the front indicator. Um, we have traditionally utilized the back indicators as well, which is like what's your post exploit compromise scenario, which is where you need to catch them um, almost immediately, right? Because there's WAF bypasses every day, every day or so. Um, so, in, in the short, yes, but like from the maturity of all generating different scenarios, figuring out um, the shift left aspect of protection engineering, um, that's not common today. I think we're trying to get there in terms of utilizing combination of those automations with SDKs um, to generate additional new cataloging and payload with that um, in tandem with the threat informed defense model. I, it, it's, it's, a, it's complicated in the fact that processes of how to create those catalogs and those use cases and maintain them is more of the issue that I see rather than creating them themselves. Um, I guess the that kind of dovetails your question. I also think there's a, a major opportunity that we haven't really focused on um, as an industry to large, not every customer is like this, uh, is behavioral based items based on using um, AI in general. And I keep using the term AI and I was tired of hearing it, but you need to utilize these models. You need to utilize more than just a linear regression pattern uh, because you're not going to be able to catch everything by generating net new uh, ASCII syntax inside the signature. So I think that's where the next generation of, of BAS instrumentation and programming comes from, along with the detection engineering programs as a whole, when you're trying to get to that next level of kind of um, response and monitoring. We definitely have. Um, so you'll be glad to know that a lot of what you're speaking to is commonly referred to as, le as um, well, assuming you're referring to an endpoint, but generally speaking, the label for that is, is often referred to as lateral movement. So you're not, not talking about ingress over a, a firewall or, or web application firewall. Uh, we test that. There, there's quite a bit SafeReach has baked in right out of the box that you could run real easily now. Um, it's, it's also um, definitely advantageous to have your <clears throat> your TAM and or your CSM walk you, walk you through it. Um, yeah, it's not difficult, difficult at all to talk uh, to test, um, whether it's through, through more automated Fashion, um, I, I would, yeah. There, there's a lot, of, a lot of that baked in SafeReach. We've, we've, uh, I, I personally have built specific scenarios in SafeReach to test lateral movement. Um, just as a simple explanation, for an example, for the sake of conversation here, um, we were, as most organizations probably would be, we're curious as to, if to, okay, well, if malware execute or drop occurs on on this endpoint, because um, again. My company's huge. We've got 27,000 new user, users spread over 50 countries. Um, and kind of to this gentleman's question, uh, what I was going to hit on, um, the other thing too is 
since our company is so large, we were curious. Uh, we actually found out through safe breach testing. I won't get into specifics uh, for obvious reasons uh, on the recorded piece, but we actually found out that we had um, different firewall rules, like same hardware, same subscription. We found out we had different firewall rules at different sites. So then, then we all started turning and we're going, okay, if mal, again, example for the sake of conversation, if malware executor drop occurs on this host at one at site A, would it make it laterally? So at that point, for all intents and purposes, right, it's, it's within your four walls, so to speak. Is it gonna be able to successfully um, execute or drop on another endpoint or host or server or whatever at another site? And if so, there's that's where you get the fork in the road um, and where you kind of get into uh, development and, and maturation of your of your not only your BAS program, um, but you're also then you're already hitting on F efficacy of controls because our approach was okay. Would it make it to another endpoint once it's within the environment, another host once it's within, within the environment? If so, obviously, if yes, that's a problem. You find out, then you start digging into the safe breach site. Why? If it didn't, what stopped it? Was it the firewall rule? Firewall rule? Was it um, lack of? Um, was it something on the OS side that stopped it? Was it something EDR that stopped it? So yes, we've tested. Uh, and I think that's, was that what you're asking, kind of more about lateral movement? Like it once within the four walls, how do we test? Like yeah, where can it go? Either way, the lateral movement, or even if you're going north and south. Yes, sir, yeah. I started the question, but both west, east, west, north, yeah. south are important. Just yeah. is the capability. I think you mentioned out of the box, and I think I'm gonna buy you both a drink during lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is the final question, if that's sure. okay. You, know, you mentioned you have 20, 27,000 users, and I was wondering if you could both kind of touch base very quickly. You know, I'm sure this is public information. You know, what, based on your company's annual revenue, whatever that is, if you, or if you have to disclose, compared to the amount of time you have resources on your team every week in the tool. I'm trying to find a something in my mind, like where's the, where's the ratio between companies? Um, any thoughts appreciated? Thanks, feel free to go all the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a tough question. I mean, yeah. so the ratio is like exponentially many to one, obviously. So I, I'd say the team, the team works in bursts when they're utilizing the tool and, and BAS to its fullest extent as a program. Um, when I say in bursts, I mean the team will have time for you know a couple of days at a time in a stretch where they need to um, implement new things to mature further. And then the simulations kind of run itself on so that's after you define them. So they kind of work in these little little sprints, if you will, or sub sprints. Um, I would say if I had to put a guess in it, and not just you know my current employer or a previous customer, but anyone using the BAS. Um, to its full extent, um, across different verticals in my consulting time, that's been um, for every every ten thousand users, we've probably only seen maybe one hour of utilizing um, tool effectiveness, um, you know, on a regular basis um, from a tactical perspective, security operations, um, routinely doing this. I think I find that mostly per day, per day, per, per day at most, yeah. I mean, and that, I think it's because they well, they get into this weird operational motion post implementation that run a tool, run a simulation, done. Here's a report, send it off to TDM for mediation kind of process or efforts. Um, so I think there's other irons in the fire that if they kind of were know how to converge or optimize the use of BAS program, they can actually you know facilitate more use of it by injecting it into utilizing risk architecture. Um, Threat, you know, the threat um, TVM team, threat intelligence team, and they're making projects, even if it's only a couple spins at a time, of small iterations. I think they're going to get more out of it um, than what I've seen traditionally in the, in the current state in the past. Definitely, I, I agree with that quantification. I'm not <coughs> going to try to work out the math in my head and go and get it. That's a solid answer. Um, I would also add to that, though, that that said hour um, is definitely time well spent. Like, are you? At that point, running your your BAS program, yes, but you're also it, it doesn't matter if it's a, a fairly new to your team analyst or somebody who's fairly new to the SecOps world, or or if you happen to hire somebody um, from another company or somebody joins your company and they've run and stood up an entire BAS program, something like this gentleman, 
Um, it's time well spent. They're, they're, you're exposed to a lot of um, valuable things that grow you as a security practitioner while running Safe Breach and while standing up the BAS program. Um, and th this is kind of a tertiary answer to your, to your time frame question. Um, one of the, the best explanation I've heard that's true of how to effectively implement Safe Breach or BAS program period is crawl walk run. Um, you're, and you guys heard Jen talk about this during um, her, her time with us. Uh, in theory, could you buy Safe Breach tomorrow and run thousands upon thousands of simulations? Sure. Or are you, what are you gonna get out of that? Well, that depends on your work, right? So it, it's generally advantageous not to be in a hurry about it and apply that crawl, walk, run methodology, which you will hear Safe Breach Tams tell you. I think, Mike, you actually did really hear about the new feature measure time in the platform versus risk reduction. So we can get a score on you know, the time you spend on the platform and how much risk you're doing. Right. Awesome. All right. So looks like we're out of time. Uh, of course, you guys can always come and ask more questions uh, to these guys. And uh, thank you. Mike, thank you. Ash, thank you so much.